help me real quick. Uh, Harvest Online is joining us this morning for the 1030 service. Would you help me welcome them? They can hear you uh, this morning. I'll look right in the camera and say thank you for joining us online today. We are so glad that you're a part of what we're doing here. And I want to give, uh, give you one announcement, and then we'll get into uh, today's message. Uh, let me remind you that, uh, you don't need to be reminded of this, but the theme in this season of life is flexibility, right? Like everything changes all of the time. It's the only thing you can count on is it's going to change, right? I mean, everything. It's just nuts. So this week, uh, there's some new updates for regulations, and it's now color-coded. And so our team quickly uh, tried to figure out what that means for uh, us and for church. And so here's what you need to know. Starting next week, uh, we are going to go back to one service. I know we just went to two. We're going back to one, and it'll be at 10 a.m., all right? So you haven't had time to get back into the 1030 routine because it's only our second week. So don't give me that nonsense, all right? So next week, 10 a.m., uh, we'll be back together. Uh, that allows us to bring everyone together in one service, which I think is just better. It's more fun uh, with everyone here. Uh, you missed a whole bunch of people that came to the nine, and so I want you to see them and worship with them and pray for them, and so we're going to be together. It also makes it a lot easier on our dream team who uh, come, you come in and you serve across this place, and uh, by the way, we'll, we'll have kids, Harvest Kids will still be happening at 10 a.m. Uh, next Sunday, and so we just want to let you know that. I'll email this week, and we'll post some reminders, but um, we're going we're gonna to make that change next week, and then um, we'll stick with that as long as we can. Um, but chances are it'll change again in a few weeks. That's just the nature of, of this season, all right? So we're going we're gonna to stay joyful and we're going to stay flexible, amen? amen? All right, three of us will do that. Uh, we're in a series called The Promises of God. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23 reminds us of this. It says, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. Uh, I just want to tell you today, in a season where, and I, we just talked about this, where things are changing all of the time, right? It's like the rules are changing, the regulations are changing, uh, uh, things are online, and then back in person, and two services, and one service. Things are changing all the time. Can I just remind you that there is someone you can hold on to, his name is Jesus, and he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So we're going to hold on swervingly to what he promises. His promises are the one thing that we can hold on to. Uh, we were talking about promises, and then a couple weeks ago, I started integrating this idea of upgrade. It's just kind of a word that, that is really in my heart right now. And the idea of upgrade is really just this, that, that God has in mind for you a better life. Now, listen, I could have said that in January before all of this COVID stuff came around because it would have been true then. I can say it today, and truthfully, even though I don't know what's coming in 2021, I could say it in 2021, and it'd still be true because this is God's heart. His heart for you and I is that we would have a better life, that he would upgrade some parts of our life. We hear his heart in Isaiah chapter 60 where he says, Instead of bronze, I will bring gold. Instead of iron, I will bring silver. Instead of wood, bronze. And instead of stones, iron. Each of those are an example of an upgrade. And then it says this, and I, I, I'm intentionally leaving this part in what we're reading every week because I think our world needs the rest of this verse. It says, I will make your officers peace and your magistrates righteousness. I think we need more peace, more more righteousness in our world today. Violence shall no longer be heard in your land, neither wasting nor destruction within your borders, but you shall call your walls salvation and your gates praise. And then one more passage in honor of Thanksgiving. Uh, Psalm 100 is one of my favorite um, psalms that has to do with this idea of thanksgiving. And Psalm 100 says this, shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us. We are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with 
thanksgiving, his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name for the Lord is good. Amen. His love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. You know, we've been talking a lot the last few weeks about this word revival, this idea that maybe, this is what I'm clinging to, friends, maybe in this season God is stirring the hearts of his people so that we will seek him and the end result might be that he pours his spirit out in unprecedented levels here in Albuquerque. Is anyone believing that with me? I'm just, I'm telling you, I'm hopeful because something good has to come out of this. Am I right? I mean, something, something good. And let me say it this, if something good is going to come out of this season, it's going to happen through God's people. So I'm hoping that you are pressing in with me to believe God for revival in our city. And this Psalm, Psalm 100, it, it really, it holds a secret for us. So the psalmist said, enter his gates with thanksgiving. Today we're going to talk about upgrading thanksgiving. Not the holiday, but our heart. A heart of thankfulness. A heart of gratitude. The psalmist says, enter the gates with thanksgiving. The idea of a gate is that a gate keeps certain people out, but it lets other people in. I don't know about you, but when it comes to God's presence, I want to be on the list of people that get to go in the gate, right? I don't want to be on the outside of the gate. I want to be in the gate. And and the psalmist helps us because it says, enter the gates with thanksgiving. In other words, our thankfulness might need an upgrade to be able to get in to the gates, right? To the presence of God. I love how the message version says, Psalm 100 says this part. It says, enter with the password, thank you. I don't know. I just love that. I've always loved this, the idea, I mean, growing up, we had like secret clubhouses and clubhouse need, clubhouses need secret passwords. And I just, so when I read this, it's just this idea that that God's people get into places of intimacy with this password, with this heart of gratitude. And I just, I just want to remind you today, we're talking about upgrading Thanksgiving, that God has a better life in mind for us, but one of the keys is going to be an attitude of gratitude. <laughs> did you have a good Thanksgiving? I, ho- I hope you did. Our Thanksgiving, um, like most of yours, was probably not the same as it usually is. You know, maybe something was disrupted this year. For us this year, we gathered with my parents and with my brother and, and his family, and uh, I got to smoke a turkey, and that was that was fun. My COVID skill, my quarantine skill, is I've improved my my smoking abilities greatly, and so I brined a turkey overnight, and we smoked a turkey, and and Lisa and Patty and Mom cooked all these sides and desserts and we had way too much food. So today I'm not going to talk about what the God's word says about gluttony just so so you feel safe, okay? Did you eat too much, anyone? Come on, anyone? Show me your hands. I can't see your smiles right now, okay? So we ate a lot of food and then my parents decided that since all six grandchildren were together, they were going to do an early Christmas present. Uh, I posted something on this. You might have seen it, but my parents decided to buy one of those giant trampolines for their backyard so that all of the grandkids could enjoy the trampoline. And uh, now just t- quick tangent, we were putting it together and I, I I just was reminded of all the things that have changed over the years. Um, you know, when, when I was a kid, you can tell I'm getting old because now I talk about when I was a kid. When I was a kid, trampolines didn't have safety nets, you know. We would move the trampoline intentionally over near the deck so we could jump off of the deck on the second floor onto the trampoline. But now they made it so much more complicated because it has nets and has a little safety thing around it so you don't pinch your fingers in there. And I don't know. I don't know. If, I don't know if I, I don't know. Anyway, we're just, we were putting the trampoline together and we had, we had a good Thanksgiving. But it's like there was just all these reminders that you know, 2020 is different, you know, 2020 Thanksgiving will be marked. Maybe you didn't get to go where you normally go or do what you normally do or whatever. I mean, it's, it's just nothing is the same this year. In fact, let me just ask you this rhetorically, or you can write it down if you want. 
how would you define 2020? If you had to pick a word or a phrase, how would you define this year? In fact, if you're watching online, you can just type it in the comments right now. That, I guess, is one advantage to being online is you can, you can communicate with us right now. Talk. I'm just curious. You know, Dave Ramsey, I listen to a lot of Dave Ramsey, and he has called this 2020 the year of the dumpster fire. Seems kind of appropriate, right? The year of the dumpster fire. Did, did you know, here, here's, a, here's a little picture I found this year or this week. It says this. It says, the dumbest thing I did in 2020 was to purchase a planner, <laughs> right? It's like, because mid-March, it all went out the window, right? How, how do you define 2020? I don't know if you know this, but there's actually a term for babies born during the pandemic. Did you know this? Like, this is for real. They call them coronials. Did you know that? For real, coronials, right? Um, Nick Martinez told me between services, he said, children born uh, between uh, or during the pandemic uh, should be called children of the corn. Quarantine. Yeah, bad joke. It was Nick's, not mine. Every year, the Oxford Dictionary team gets together and they pick a word to describe the year. So this year they got together to try to describe 2020. They couldn't agree on one word, so they came up with 40 words. That's how many they needed to describe 2020. Here's a few of the words that they used. Uh, of course, the word coronavirus, which pre-March, you know, March, none of us had ever even used the word, but all of a sudden it became one of the most used words in the English language. So that made their top 40 list. They used some other words like super spreader and social distancing the word pandemic, which has increased 57,000% this year, right? I don't know how they measure that, but I'm helping them today. I'm using it today. How about this word, blurs day? Have you heard that word? Blurs day is used to describe how all the days blur together when you're in quarantine. <laughs> what day is it? It's blurs day. Here's some other words they chose. Covidiots and doom scrolling and wokeness and cancel culture. And I'll just give you one more. Zoom. Zoom used to be a setting on a camera. Now you have, some of you might have had a Zoom Thanksgiving or you've had some Zoom meetings. If you've had Zoom meetings, you might have experienced Zoom fatigue, right? I mean, now we use it in all these other ways. I mean, the, the point is that without doubt, this year has marked us. Nothing is the same. Everything's on its head. But I just want to remind you today that God's heart for you is for a better life. I read an account this week in the Gospel of Luke about some guys who needed a better life, but the reality is their lives were so bad that I think if I'm in their shoes, they're beginning to question. I mean, if, if they were here today and they heard me announce this, they might push back a little and say, I don't know, Pastor, I don't know if God wants a better life. I mean, you don't know my life. You don't know how bad it is to be in my life. I don't know if that's really true. They would probably push back. They might say, I don't know if, if that's really true. These 10 men had a disease, a very severe disease called leprosy. If you had leprosy, you would be quarantined away from your family, away from your loved ones. It was a painful uh, disease physically. It literally caused your skin to rot from the outside in. So it was very painful physically. It was painful emotionally because you couldn't be with anybody. I mean, as soon as you got it, you were sent away to live you know, by yourself because it was so contagious. They didn't want anyone else to get it. So now emotionally, you had all this, this baggage. And then it was, um, it was, it was painful spiritually because the, the super spiritual elite of the day said, well, if you have leprosy, obviously God is punishing you for some big sin that you've committed. And so now you're also living with this weight of, you know, my parents quarantined me and my friends don't love me. And maybe God doesn't love me either. So, I mean, they're living with this intense pain in their lives. And, and I think I would have had to fight really hard to convince these 10 lepers 
that God had a heart of upgrade for them, a better life. We read about this in Luke chapter 17, and it says this. It says, Now, on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. He was uh, going into a village. Ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance, and they called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, Go, show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he was healed, one of them, when he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And it says, and he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? And then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. As I read this passage this week, there was a, a single word that kind of came up in my heart. And it was this word, unexpected. Unexpected. I want to talk to you today about some unexpected things that happen in this story that I think God has in store for you and I today. The first thing I see is an unexpected miracle. Unexpected miracle. Now, obviously, the lepers were asking Jesus for a miracle. I mean, they spot Jesus traveling down the road, and they, they call out, and just notice this, they call out, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. Take note as you're reading through the Gospels at the name that is ascribed to Jesus in that particular story because the name actually will signify something. It'll tell you something. In this case, they use, they use his name Jesus, but then they call him Master. And this is important because in, in using the term Master, what they're saying is that they believe that Jesus has the authority to be able to heal them, that he's the Master, so he has the authority over disease. I mean, you don't call someone someone master unless you're willing to place yourself under their authority. And maybe you need to be reminded today that the God that we serve is the master. The God that we serve has all authority. He, he's, listen, I know it sounds like a church answer, but Jesus really is the answer. He's big enough. He's strong enough. He can heal. He can provide. He can comfort. He's the master and he has the authority. So if this is true, then why is this an unexpected miracle? Well, it's, it's not that the miracle was unexpected, but it's how the miracle took place that was unexpected. Jesus tells him, says, go and show yourself to the priest. So that part is like, well, what's going on there? Well, showing yourself to the priest was part of the protocol to verify that you had been healed or you had been cured. So that part was normal. The unexpected part is that when the lepers leave Jesus, they still have leprosy. And the, the miracle takes place somewhere between talking to Jesus and getting to the priest. That's, that's the unexpected part. Now, when I read the Bible, I like to insert myself into the story. And when I insert myself into the story, I bring with it, you know, my personality. I bring with it kind of my thinking and my, you know, how I would process things. And, and, and I have to tell you, I like the creativity of Jesus in this story. But if I insert myself into the story, I'm not sure that I like it. I mean, I come to Jesus and I'm like, Jesus, Master, ha have pity on us. And his answer is, go show yourself to the priest. Now I have a decision to make because leprosy is so visual. It's so noticeable. Literally, these 10 men could look down at the, themselves and see that the leprosy is still there. But now they have a choice because Jesus has given them an instruction to go and to verify their healing with the priest. So we don't know how exactly it happens. We don't get to hear the conversations between the ten men. We don't know exactly how far they had to travel to get to the priest. We don't know at what point between there and the priest. We don't know any of the details of how it happened. What I do know is they had a decision to make in that moment when Jesus says, go and talk to the priest. They had a decision to make. Are 
we going to believe the evidence that we see with our physical eyes or are we going to trust that what God has told us is true and are we going to act upon that? How many of you know that's literally faith? I mean, we... We talk about faith. I mean, we're people of faith, but can we just admit today that there are moments when faith is not really fun? I mean, it's like they had a choice. You know, I, I don't know how they did it, right? But again, I'm inserting myself into the story. Somebody is like, somebody, one of the 10 said, this is stupid, guys. I can't believe we're doing this. I mean, look at us. You still have leprosy. I mean, come, we're really, we can't go to the priest. But somebody in the group had some faith, right? Somebody in the group was like, no, 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 no. Jesus said it. He promised it. Let's hold on swervingly. You know, I don't know what they said, but they're like, somebody said, I think that we should go. And so at some point, the 10 men decided to go. And somewhere along the way, I just, I, wouldn't you love to be able to see this story unfolding? You know, like, did all 10 get healed all at once? Or did the guy with more faith get healed first? I don't know. All of a sudden, they're, they're, they're between. Isn't, isn't it between seasons? Isn't, isn't that the hardest? I mean, that's kind of the whole deal with 2020 is we're perpetually stuck between, right? We're just, we're, they're just between. It's like they're, they're, they, they're told they're healed, but they haven't been verified yet. They're just kind of moving between but then they look at one another and something began to happen and all of a sudden they're seeing that the healing is taking place. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be fun to watch? Wouldn't it be fun to hear the conversation like, oh my good, Joe, Joe, what's something's happening to your skin? Dan, oh my goodness, what's going on? I mean, can you imagine that happening? And they go, that is the unexpected part. The evidence begins to change. The evidence, I mean, they're, they're seeing their skin literally change before them. I just, I don't know what you need today, but I'm just telling you, this is an unexpected miracle, but it required faith. It required trust. I don't, I don't know what God's whispering into your heart in your quiet times, but I can probably be sure that as he's talking to you, the things he's talking to you about are going to require some faith and they're going to require some trust. But as you move, as you act in that, there could be an unexpected miracle. I also had a thought this week because I, I don't know, I don't know how this has happened for you, but for me, it seems like when there's a miracle, there's always someone waiting to try to explain my miracle away. Have you ever experienced that? I mean, it's just like there's always a naysayer. There's always someone ready to, to try to, you know, combat, you know, the, the miracle that's taking place. And I love that, I just, I think Jesus was showing off here because he didn't just heal one person with leprosy, he healed 10 people. And I don't know about you, but that would be much harder to explain away. I love how Jesus just kind of flexes his muscle. He's like, let me just show you how powerful I am. Can I, can I just tell you today, don't underestimate my God. I know this season's been trying. I know everything we have is being put to the test, but don't underestimate the authority of the God that we serve. He is big enough. He is strong enough. He is able. I see an unexpected miracle. The other thing I see is unexpected thanksgiving. Ten men are healed, only one comes back. Look at verse 15 again. It says, one of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And then it points out this detail. It says, and he was a Samaritan. Why does the scripture point out that the one who comes back is a Samaritan. Well, you might know this, but in case you don't, the Samaritans and the Jews were enemies with one another. So this was particularly odd that Jesus would heal someone who is at odds as a people group. I mean, we're talking like age-old war, age-old you know, division. Like these two groups of people don't get along. So this, this really helps us to see 
idea why this was such an unexpected Thanksgiving, that the one, the one out of the ten who's at odds, he's a Samaritan, he's the guy who comes back. And it, it got me thinking that perhaps, perhaps it's because the Samaritan had a deeper appreciation for what God had done for him. I mean, think about it. If a Jewish miracle worker heals Jewish people, there's almost a sense of, well, yeah, that's what he should do, right? Like, that's expected. That, but, but, but the fact that he heals a Samaritan, that, now it's, it's unexpected. I mean, think about it. This miracle for all ten of them, uh, but especially for the Samaritan, it was unmerited favor. And this Samaritan knew that. He understood that he didn't deserve this miracle, Listen, if you, don't, if you don't believe that you deserve something, you tend to be more grateful for it. Am I right? When you, when you feel like you deserve something, then you, just, you tend to take it for granted. But when you understand, man, I, I'm receiving something that I don't deserve, it, just, it increases your gratefulness. So let me, just, let me just make an observation after about 20 years of pastoring. Christians who have gone to church for a long time tend to start to think of themselves as good. Christians who've gone to church for a long time tend to start thinking that maybe they deserve the blessings of God because they've gone to a lot of church services and they've paid a lot of money in the tithe and they've served a lot of hours in kids ministry and they've you know whatever they've baked a lot of dishes for the potlucks you know I don't know I mean I'm just telling you it's just an observation I'm not judging you I'm just saying the longer that you follow Christ the the harder it is to to really fight for that deep appreciation that you really don't deserve all that God is doing. I'll just say it this way today. It's really not a good idea to start talking to God about what we deserve. I mean, the reality is that the scriptures are really clear that all of us fall short of the glory of God. That all of us are sinners. So you start talking to God about what you deserve. I mean, the scripture is pretty clear that the wages of sin is death. And so it's like, you want to talk to God about what you deserve? I mean, I'm just telling you, that's a dangerous place to go. But I, just, I also want to remind you that God's heart is for upgrade. That although we don't deserve his love, we sang about it earlier, he gives it to us. Although we don't deserve his grace, he gives it to us. Although we don't deserve his blessing, he gives it to us. And this story reminds us that it, those of us who are most conscious about what God has done for us tend to be the most grateful. I, I've mentioned this a few times during this series, but I'm preaching on the promises of God because my heart needed the reminder. And then I thought maybe you needed it too. But I'm just telling you, this series is deeply personal. It's because I needed to be reminded of the promises of God. And I'll just, I'll just own it today that particularly this message on upgrading Thanksgiving, this message particularly is for me. So my current reality is that I've been battling a bad attitude. Anyone else? You would make me feel better if you admitted it. Thank you. I've been battling a bad attitude. I'm just telling you. I, it's been hard for me to, to maintain joy. I mean, I'm just, I'm tired. Like, I'm just, this season is exhausting. It's like running a race where the, the finish line always moves. I mean, you, you think you're there and then it moves again. I'm just, I'm just telling you, I'm just tired. And I know I'm just complaining at this point, but like, I want to go to a movie again, you know? Sounds so petty, but... You know, back in the day, like 14 years ago in 2019, you know, the kids would go to school and Lisa and I would sneak away on Mondays and go to a movie and eat popcorn and like, I just want to go to a movie again, you know, and I, I want to travel again and I want to, I want our church back, really, like, like all, like all of the church, I want everyone back in one room. I don't like 
I don't like this season. I'm just, I'm just telling you. I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to make you. I'm not trying to make you negative today. I'm just felt like I should own it today that it's been really hard. And this week, you know, I realized how entitled and self-centered I've become. On Friday, the governor put out the new red, green, yellow, purple, orange, silver plan, and I don't know, all the colors, and I just, I went to Lisa, and I was just really mad. I said, I need to go to the store. She said, you just came from the store. I said, I just need to get out of here. I just need to go for a walk. I'm just mad. She goes, where are you going to go? I said, to Home Depot. It's my happy place, you know? And I went to Home Depot, and I got to Home Depot, and then I had to stand in line to get into my happy place, and that made me more upset. Anyone relate? I mean, I just was like, oh, I can't even go to Home Depot right now, <laughs> you know? And I'm standing in line, and I just, I realized how self-centered and ungrateful I'd become. And I'm standing in line at Home Depot, and uh, I, I don't, I'm so thankful for godly heritage because I just had this memory all of a sudden of my grandparents. They pastored this little country church in rural Oklahoma, and I loved visiting their church. I mean, there'd be like, you know, 25 people, and man, they just, they love Jesus. And I remember visiting them, and some of you might know this song, but I remember them singing this song. I won't sing it for you because then you won't be thankful, but it goes like this. It says, count your blessings, name them one by one, count your many blessings, see what God has done. And then I thought, I don't have anything to be thankful for. <laughs> have, you, have you thought that in this season? And then I started counting my blessings. I started thinking. And you know what I realized in that moment? Is that even in this season, I have more to be thankful for than not. I'm just telling you, it's like all of a sudden I began to realize as I rehearsed the blessings of God, I, I realized that God really has done more for me than I had been giving him credit for. And this might sound silly because Thanksgiving comes at the same time every year, but Thanksgiving came, the holiday, came at a really good time this year, right? In the middle of pandemic, Thanksgiving came you know, it couldn't be canceled, right? Thanksgiving came as a great reminder for us to count our blessings. You know what would be unexpected to the world today? Not a grumpy church. That would be expected, right? Not a mad church. That's too predictable because everyone's mad right now. You know what would be unexpected to the world today? A thankful church. Is it possible for us to model thanksgiving in the middle of pandemic? Is it possible for us to find things to be thankful for even though our normal has been disrupted and stuff's getting shut down and we're having to homeschool our kids? And I mean, is it possible to be thankful right now? I, I think the answer is yes. <laughs> but I've had to talk myself into it this week. I'll just tell you that. I had to rehearse the blessings of God and in that, I found a, an unexpected thankfulness. Here, here's the third thing that I see in this story is an unexpected grace. Unexpected grace. I love to talk about the topic of God's grace. I, just, I love it. And, I, and I'll just tell you why. I grew up in the church. I grew up singing the songs about grace. I learned, I, I learned verses about grace. I learned the stories in God's word that illustrate the grace of God. I mean, I, I grew up learning all of that. But I'll tell you why I love talking about the grace of God. I love talking about the grace of God because I've experienced the grace of God. I'll go back to this idea that Often the most grateful are the ones who are the most aware. Aware that we didn't deserve what God has done for us. And I'll just tell you, there was a season in my life where all of a sudden I became aware, personally aware, that I did not deserve the grace that God was giving me in that moment. 
In fact, I very vividly remember this moment where Lisa and I were driving down the road in the car. We had the radio on and all of a sudden a song came on about the love of God. And I'm just telling you, it was just one of these sweet moments where I just sensed the Holy Spirit there in our car. And I became painfully aware that I did not deserve the love of God in that moment. And I just began to weep. I'm just telling you, like, it got to the point, this is so unusual for me, but it got to the point where I pulled the car over because I realized that if I didn't, we were about to go meet this God who loved us so much. And I remember sitting on the side of the road, just, just be so aware that I was receiving a love and a grace that I did not deserve. But isn't that the definition of grace that we, we get that we, the things that we don't deserve and he keeps from us the things that we do deserve. I mean, isn't that it? And that's the, that's the very foundation of the gospel is the grace of God. Can I just remind you today, because it might make you a little more thankful, that Jesus paid for your sins. Can I just remind you today that Jesus steps into our messes can I remind you today that Jesus listens to your cries? The things that you're thinking about as you're trying to fall asleep and you're worrying about and you're anxious about and you're frustrated about. Can I just, can I just tell you that Jesus is ready to just get in the middle of all of that with you. Like, I mean, that's one of the things that differentiates the gospel from every other religious belief is that God, the God that we serve, doesn't stand off at afar and just, you know, watch you waller around in your pain. He says, hey, if you'll let me, I'll come and I'll get in the middle of this with you and I'll walk with you through this and I'll comfort you through this. In fact, there's that great promise where he said, Jesus said, I'm going to leave the earth. But when I leave, I'm going to send someone specifically to comfort you, to advocate for you, to be with you. He sent the Holy Spirit so that we don't have to go through this mess on our own. Talk about the grace of God. And in this, in this story, I'll show you where I see the grace of God, is that all 10 men were healed. Let me tell you why I see grace. One grateful man was healed. Nine ungrateful men were healed. Sometimes I read God's word and I think, I'm so glad that God is God and that I'm not God. Because I would be so tempted in that moment to look at the nine and to say, you ungrateful little turds. I'm going to reverse the healing right now. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? God, this, this is where I see the grace of God, is he's just like, I'm going to just bless you because you don't deserve it, and I'm going to let you keep that blessing even if you aren't thankful for it. It's not like he reverses it because the nine didn't come back. I mean, he asks about it. He's like, hey, where's the other nine? Where are all ten of you healed? But the reality is when I read that, I realized the grace of God is so big it's almost unexplainable, right? It's just like, I mean, how do you, how, how do, you do this, God? How do you, you keep, you keep waiting on us. You keep coming back to us. You, you bless us even when we have bad attitudes or good attitudes. You bless us. Like, this is the grace of God, and maybe you need the grace of God today. Paul writes about something in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. You might remember this. He talks about a thorn in his flesh. Do you remember this? We don't know what the thorn is. There, there's a bunch of theories and, you know, you can study it. And, but the bottom line is we don't really know what the thorn in Paul's flesh is. But, but you might remember this. Paul, he, he, he cries out to God three separate times, he says. And he says, God, take this away from me. Take, take this pain away. Take this thorn away. I don't know if I can handle this anymore. And do you remember what God says in response back to Paul? God says to him, he says, my grace is sufficient for you. My grace. Can I just announce over harvest today that there is a grace available for this season that we're currently in? 
There's a grace available for whatever you're facing today. There's a grace available if you've been unemployed. There's a grace available if your marriage is challenging. There's a grace available when your kids don't listen to you. There's a grace available when your husband doesn't listen to you. Like there's, just, there's a grace for this season. God says to Paul, he says, my grace is sufficient. My power is made perfect in weakness. And Paul he changes his attitude. Now, you read through the verses, and it seems like this attitude shift is really fast, but chances are there was a little more happening to this. And here's what I do know, is that Paul doesn't directly call out gratefulness, but I know that for Paul to have this attitude shift, there had to be a gratitude shift. I'm just telling you, where all of a sudden Paul begins to realize the grace of God that he's receiving that he doesn't deserve is enough to sustain him in this season. I'm telling you, there had to be a, a gratitude shift because all of a sudden Paul says, okay, I will boast more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness. Isn't it, isn't it amazing how all of a sudden Paul's attitude begins to change? I mean, one moment he's like, take this away, take this away. And Paul's so like dramatic, right? And then in the next breath, he's like, okay, I will boast in this weakness. Why? Why am I going to boast in the insults and the hardships and the persecution and the difficulties? Because Paul says, for when I am weak, that's when I am strong. Because when I eat, reach the end of the rope, that's where God's grace comes in. When I, when I realize I'm out of my own strength, that's where the strength of God comes in. And there's this unexpected grace that happens. Maybe you need the grace of God today. Ch chances are you do. I think we need a, maybe a double dose of it today. I want, I want you to know there's some good news today that the grace of God is available to every one of us today. There's no shortage of his grace and that his grace is enough. Why don't you stand with me today? We're going to close with just a few minutes of worship. And as we're worshiping, I want to encourage you to rehearse in your heart all the things that you have to be grateful for. Here's what will happen. As you shift your focus to all the things that God has blessed you with, instead of focusing on all the things that you don't have or can't have or places you can't go or things you can't do, all of a sudden, your attitude will change. I'm just telling you today, what the world needs is some thankful people, a thankful church in the middle of crisis. Can I pray for you today? Jesus, thank you for being here with us today. And as we worship, we're going we're gonna to remember all the things that you've blessed us with, all the things that you've done for us, all the things you've done through us, all, all the blessings of God. And Lord, as we do, I'm just believing you that you'll shift our hearts towards gratitude. Lord, I pray for those today who need a miracle. <laughs> Lord, I pray that today that your word would be received into our hearts today and that somewhere between receiving that word and, and then acting that in, in faith and in trust, that somewhere there that an unexpected miracle would happen. I pray for that today. I pray for miracles to happen across this room, every person watching online, every person in the room, Lord, that your power would be on display, that you would quiet the voice of the enemy, that you would exercise your authority over sickness, over disease, over poverty, over depression, over fear, over worry, over finances, over jobs, that you would exercise your authority today. Lord, we declare today that you are God today. You are God. You're on the throne. You're the master today. You have all authority. And so we choose today, in spite of whatever evidence is before us, we choose today to believe and to hold on to your promises. And it's in your name we pray today. Amen. Church, let's worship this morning.